developers. How many of you got to see Rajesh's demo this morning where Ashima showed passwordless and the Microsoft identity platform? Well, if you missed it, don't worry. This session is packed full of demos. My name is Lasha Nalapa, and I'm a PM on the Microsoft identity team driving app registration experiences in the Azure portal. And my name is Say Doctor. I'm a lead PM on the Microsoft identity team in charge of authentication SDKs. Let's get started. Before we get started, I'll tell you about the Microsoft Identity Platform and why you're going to love it. How many of you think integrating with Microsoft's Identity Stack is easy? Well, that's very little of you. So we'll get started with showing a demo of how actually we have made it really easy to integrate with the Microsoft Identity Platform. Then we'll take a look at what goes on behind the scenes and how you get a lot of stuff for free without having to write any additional extra code. Then we'll take a look at some advanced scenarios, like how to control user consent experiences and customize your, customize your application. Lastly, we have some release announcements and an update on our roadmap. So, what is the Microsoft Identity Platform? First of all, the Microsoft Identity Platform allows you to build applications that target organizational accounts, also referred to as Azure AD accounts, as well as personal Microsoft accounts such as Live and Hotmail accounts. Together, this accounts for over a billion users, and all of these users see a unified sign-in experience. You can also use Azure AD V2C to sign in users who bring an email or a social identity. Next, the Microsoft Identity Platform allows you to build data-rich applications. You can connect to any of your APIs as well as a variety of Microsoft APIs, such as Microsoft Graph. We are on a mission to rid the world of passwords with technologies like Windows Hello, Microsoft Authenticator, and FIDO2 security keys. Future-proof your application by building on the Microsoft Identity Platform. Conditional access is one of Azure AD's fastest growing features. It allows IT admins to do things like set policies where an employee is prompted for multi-factor authentication when they are not in the office. Build on our platform to comply with these policies really easily. You get all of this with a simple developer, pl developer platform. We've given you an easy app registration experience and a family of open source authentication libraries. And the best part, is that this is an evolution of Azure Active Directory for developers. That means all of your existing applications and APIs are not left behind. They can interoperate with your new ones. This ecosystem already has over a million active applications. Well, when we asked you if identity was simple, not many of you raised your hand. Well, we're gonna change that. It, identity can be simple, and we've made great strides in simplifying the developer experience. I'm gonna show you what that looks like. Let's build an app. Here I am in the app registrations portal in Azure Active Directory. Here's a list of all my apps. I'm gonna go ahead and build a new app. You need to register your app with the Microsoft Identity Platform in order for your app to complete a sign-in process and in order for it to connect up to the service. And you need three things. The first thing is the name. This is the name of the application that your end users will see when they sign into the app. The second thing is who can sign into the app. So you see three options here. The first option is all the users within your organization. The second option is users in any organization. Imagine you're building a line of business app that any enterprise or school can use. And the third is the broadest possible reach, which is your application signing in any Microsoft identity, whether it be personal or work or school. And lastly, there's a redirect URI that's necessary. You can think of this as an allow list of safe places to send an access token. 
we don't want to be sending an access token which can be used to access user data to any malicious app. We want it to go to your app. So I'm going to fill these out. We're going to sign in any Microsoft identity. And I'm going to leave redirect URI blank for now. And we're going to run through a quick start that will create us a local host redirect URI for local testing. We're going to jump right to the quick start experience. So I'd like to point out that this one app registration that you've created can be used for all of your app platforms. You don't need a, crap, a separate app registration for web, for desktop, for mobile. You can use one app registration for all the platforms of your application that you're building. And this one app registration, again, can be used for any platform and any Microsoft identity signing in. We're going to build a JavaScript browser-based application, also called single-page application. Now, when I open this quick start, the first thing you'll see is a diagram that explains the authentication flow and what's happening under the hood. You don't have to understand any of this quite yet. You can just follow along with the quick start and refer back to this once you want to know more. So I'm going to scroll down, and I'm going to go to the first step. And the first step is to configure that redirect URI for localhost testing and to enable a flow called implicit grant, implicit grant flow. This is an authentication flow that's designed for building browser-based applications or single-page applications. I'm going to click Make These Changes for Me, and I get to preview exactly what changes are going to be made to my app registration. It looks good. Redirect URI, implicit grant flow. I'm going to make these updates. And right away, we get confirmation that this app registration is now configured with the necessary attributes to be able to run this quick start. The next step is to download this project. I'm going to open it in code. Now, if I scroll past the HTML and I get to the JavaScript, the first thing that I see is the configuration. The app registration that we created in the portal created a client ID. This is a GUID that uniquely identifies your application. So it says, enter the application ID here. We need to grab it. We've made this easy in the portal. So I click Copy. I go back to the code. I paste it right here. I save this off. And we're going to run it. And we're not even 10 minutes in, and we already have an application running. Let me show you that it works. I click Sign In. And I automatically get single sign-on experience. I hit Accept. And it's now giving me information about this user. So I'm signed in with a worker school account. It's calling Microsoft Graph. It's calling the me endpoint. This endpoint returns information about the phone number, the uh, office, you know, uh, first name, last name, that sort of thing. Let me sign in with a NSA, a Microsoft account. This is a personal account.
going to sign in again. This time, because I'm signed in with two accounts, I get an account selection screen to select my personal account or my work account. I sign in with my personal account. And again, I get a consent dialog. The con the for my personal account, I need to trust this app to be able to read my profile information. I click yes. And great, it returns information. So let me show you what the code looks like. In order to call Microsoft Graph, we need to ask permission to read data. In the Microsoft Authentication Library, the way you do this is by passing a scoped parameter. This is a comma-separated list of human-readable, least-privileged scopes that allows you to control exactly what data you need access to. We need to call the Me endpoint, so this is a Microsoft Graph REST API endpoint that we're going to call. And I'm going to show you this pattern. This is a common pattern you'll see throughout all of our quick starts and samples. We try acquire token silent, and if that fails, then we do acquire token pop up. This maximizes our opportunity for getting a single sign on experience and ensures that in the situations where we do need interactive UI, such as uh, multi factor authentication or consent screens, that the app, if it is unable to get a token silently, pops the necessary interactive dialog for the user to complete that flow. That was simple, wasn't it? That was simple. With just a few simple steps, we were able to get our basic application configured. First, we registered the application by providing name, which accounts we want to support, and a redirect URI. Then we were able to use a quick start for the platform of our choice to download the sample code. And lastly, we needed to provide the permissions for the data that we need access to. And the best part is that you get a lot for free without having to write any extra code. You get access to features like single sign-on, token management, password list, and satisfying conditional access policy. Well, that's it, folks. You can go home. But stick around, because the rest of the session is about getting the most out of the Microsoft Identity Platform. We'll talk about customizing your app registration. This includes branding and requesting access to more data. We'll talk about permissions and consent and how the flows work from all the different perspectives, from the user perspective, from the developer IT perspective. We'll talk about best practices to get great single sign-on experiences within your application, as well as some security best practices. And we'll talk about your existing investments and all those APIs you have, your own APIs, Microsoft Graph APIs, uh, m other Microsoft APIs, and how you can access a diverse set of APIs using the Microsoft Identity Platform. So we saw that Saeed configured a basic registration for his application, but we'll take a closer look into what that experience looks like and what kind of customizations we can make. So we'll get back into this portal experience, and I want to draw your attention to this list of applications here. This shows a list of all of your applications that were registered with the Microsoft Identity Platform, regardless of which portal experience you use. Now we'll go ahead and click into one of these. This is the overview of the application. It shows you, shows you some basic information about the app like its application ID, which we use in code to reference this registration. It also shows us which account types we're supporting, that a redirect URI was registered, some links to documentation, and some steps to get started. Now we'll take a look at this left-hand navigation here. 
we did a big hard sorting exercise with developers to figure out how the properties of an application object should be grouped. And we think we figured it out. So let's take a look at branding. This has all of the information associated with what your users will see when they're signing in and consenting to your application. It has the name of the app, a logo, link to terms of service and privacy statement. We'll see later how this information is reflected to the end user. In certain scenarios, an application needs to prove its identity. It can do so using a client secret, also referred to as an application password, or even better, a certificate. You can configure those pieces of information here. I'm going to skip over API permissions for now. We'll see that in a second and move on to exposing an API. If you're building an API, you'll need to provide a unique identifier, which is referred to as the application ID URI. Then you can go ahead and define your permissions. Here we have two permissions, the payroll.readwrite.all permission and payroll.read. Notice that the payroll.read permission can be consented to by admins and users. This other one we consider more highly privileged, so it can only be consented to by admins. Not only do we have the UI, we also have an API. So the API can be really useful in some scenarios, which is uh, DevOps. Imagine that you need to roll keys from time to time. Another scenario that might be really interesting for the AP programmatic API is if you do need to do nightly testing, where you want to build up an app, go through a bunch of authentication and testing, and then tear it down. Let me show you what this API looks like. We're gonna use a tool called Graph Explorer. I can get there by going to aka.msge for Graph Explorer. Now, this tool is about exploring all the different APIs in Graph, rather than having to write a bunch of code and then run it locally, see if that makes any sense. Uh, this allows you to play around with APIs, see the results, and then decide, okay, yeah, this makes sense for my app. So I'm signed in with my work account here, and if you wanna see what APIs are available, you just go to this show more samples and see that I've turned on applications beta here. That gives me the side panel and we have all the different APIs, example APIs that you can run. So listing an application, creating a new application, updating, deleting. We're gonna click retrieve a list. This calls the slash applications endpoint with a rest get call. And it returns the JSON result, which has all of our applications, including the application that we just registered earlier. So in summary, this gives you the most flexibility, whether it's an API or the portal, you have your choice. We recommend if you're building your first application that you go to the portal and go through the experience first, and then as you need DevOps or testing scenarios, then you use the API. We've mentioned permissions and consent, but let's take a deeper dive into what these things mean. As an application developer, you request permissions for the data that your application needs access to. But you don't actually get access to this data until a user or an admin grants consent. Consent is requested in the form of a consent prompt, which you can see on the right. It contains a bunch of data that the end user or admin can use to make an educated decision about whether or not they want to grant consent to your application. For example, it has the name of the application that's requesting access, its logo, its terms of service and privacy statement for the user to review, and where the user can go if they change their mind later and would like to revoke consent. 
When a user makes a decision here, ultimately the IT admin can override that decision. They can choose to disable apps in their ecosystem. What this consent prompt also has is a list of requested permissions. We'll take a look at how the developer can actually configure these permissions. In summary, consent is the broker between what a user wants, what IT wants, and what the developer is trying to do. So let's take a look at the developer and IT admin experiences. So we're back in the portal here, and we're going to look at the API permissions section. We can see that we're already requesting access to some permission, but we'll go ahead and request some more. We'll click Add a Permission, and here we have a variety of Microsoft APIs to select from. We can also select from APIs our organization uses or our own APIs. We're going to select Microsoft Graph. Now we have a choice between delegated permissions and application permissions. Delegated permissions are used when there's a signed in user present. So for example, if I'm building a payroll application where my employees can sign in and see their payroll data, I would use delegated permissions. On the other hand, application permissions are used when the application is running as a background service. So if I'm building a payroll processing application that runs in the background, I'd use application permissions. For our purposes, we're going to select de delegated permissions and request access to reading users' calendars. So we'll navigate to the calendars section, and we'll go ahead and dig in and find the calendars.read permission. Notice here that it's a lot easier to find the permissions that you need to request, and you can see a lot of data about the permissions. We'll go ahead and request the calendars.read permission and go ahead and add it to the application. When we do that, it's now requested in the table of, of permissions, and we get a not notification that permissions have changed. Now, this is just requesting access to these permissions. But like I mentioned before, a user or an admin has to actually grant consent for the application to have access to this data. Because I'm signed in with an admin account, I can actually go ahead and grant admin consent for my directory. I'm going to confirm the action. And now we can see that admin consent has been granted for these permissions in my directory. That means when my Contoso users sign into this application, they will not need to grant consent themselves. Now let's go ahead and look at what the IT administrator's view looks like. For an IT administrator, when they navigate to the enterprise application section of Azure Active Directory in the Azure portal, they see a view like this where they can see which permissions have been granted consent by their users. They can see this data and they can ultimately choose to revoke the access or disable the application in their tenant if they decide that it's not right for them. Let's talk about some of the best practices for permission and consent. First up, you want to build apps with least privilege. You don't want to be asking for a bunch of permissions that your application doesn't need because it becomes a target for malicious actors to try and figure out how they can take advantage of those overprivileges. Next is, whenever a user signs in, you want to use user-delegated permissions in order to access their data. Let's go back to the quick start. In the quick start, we asked for user.read. User.read is a user-delegated permission that allows the app to only access that user's data. There is also what we call an app permission called user.read.all. It allows you to read all user data inside the entire directory of the organization. This is designed for situations like a background process or a daemon app that needs to process all the data for all the users in the directory 
but it's not appropriate for your app to use when in the context of a user that is signed in. The next up is, have you ever had that situation when you get a consent dialogue that asks for like 40 permissions and you haven't even used the app yet? And you're thinking, do I say yes to this thing? What is it gonna access? And what is it gonna do with all that data? Well, nobody, we have data showing that customers don't like this experience. You wanna build your application to ask only for the minimum of what's necessary to get started and see value in your application before you start asking for permission after permission. And when you ask for permissions after they've interacted with the application, it'll make sense to them in context why that permission might be necessary. And they're much more likely to accept. Next, regardless of whether you ask for permissions in your application up front or whether you ask for permissions down the road incrementally within your application, we want you to aggregate all of the different permissions that your app ever asks for and configure them in the app registration on the portal. Why would you, so why do we ask you to do this? There are enterprise and school experiences, organizational IT administrator experiences, where they want to pre-consent your application for use within the organization so that their users never see a consent screen. In order for us to do this successfully, we need the full list, the upfront, the incremental, everything. And that doesn't mean that your app gets all of those permissions when it starts. It doesn't. It gets only the permissions that you ask for in code, and the list in the app reg portal is necessary for IT administrators to click one button and pre-consent everything that the app will ever ask for. So if you follow this best practice and an IT administrator pre-consents your app, users in that organization will never see a consent screen. All of these best practices and a lot more are available on our identity platform checklist, and this is great for making sure that your app is ready to get to production. So I mentioned don't ask for all the things up front. And you may be thinking, well, that sounds complicated. Let me show you how it looks. OK, this is the quick start that you're all familiar with now. What we're going to do is we're going to add another button called the share button. Now, let me give you the scenario. You want to maximize the viral nature of your app and get as many of the coworkers using it as possible so that you can go to your boss and say, look at what a great job I did. The whole organization is using the app. So we're going to add a share button. This is going to call Graph and request a list of all the people that I work with and allow me to select one of them so that I can very quickly get everyone else into the app that I love. Let's start with the permission. So we ask for user.read user .read up front. We're going to ask for people.read down the road. And we're going to call this INC, incremental for short. Then we need another endpoint. So let me take this graph endpoint, duplicate it. This is going to be the people endpoint. And now we're going to go to that function where I showed you we call acquire token silent and then call interactive. We're going to duplicate it. Now, I'm sure you could do a much better job of not duplicating so much code. But I'm hacking and slashing. So 
We're no longer requesting our upfront permissions. We're now going to request whether it's silent or pop-up, we're going to ask for our incremental permissions. And we're no longer going to call the graph endpoint, me endpoint. We're going to call graph people endpoint. And now we need to wire up this function to a button. So I'm going to copy this. We're going to grab, duplicate this line, add a share button. We're going to call our new function. Share. And while I get this running, Lesha is going to explain exactly what we expect to see. So we expect that when we sign into this application, we will not see a consent prompt at first because we've already consented to those permissions when Saeed signed in earlier. However, when we click the share button, we'll expect to see a new consent prompt that has the additional permissions he's requesting. Let's see if that's what happens. I'm just going to show you that this works with both personal accounts and work accounts. So I'm going to sign in. And I get to choose any type of identity. I'm going to choose my personal. And this is the first API call. So we already consented. We never saw a consent dialog, just as Lasha said. Now we're going to click share. Cross your fingers that I didn't make a mistake. We get the consent dialog because we are now requesting access to read users of, that are relevant to me, my people list. So all I have to do is click yes and agree to this. And now we've requested permission. We're able to call the people API and get a list of all the people that are relevant to me now that I have permission. Let's continue on with some best practices. First up, single sign-on. Nobody likes to see constant pop-ups saying, sign in, sign in, sign in. Well, we've really made this simple. We give you two API calls, one called acquire token silent and one called acquire token. This is the common pattern that you want to use throughout your code. It not only gives you the best single sign-on experience, it also allows you to handle situations like IT policy. So one of those situations might be if, you, if your IT administrator has set a policy to require multi-factor authentication when you're not in the office. So what would happen is, even though you are signed in and you try and acquire a token silently, it would fail. You would go to acquire a token, you get an interactive dialog, and then you would be able to complete the multi-factor authentication in that dialog and then get into the application. So next up is best practices for security. Don't try and implement the protocol yourself. We've made a significant investment in the Microsoft Authentication Library and .NET middleware to make this super easy, whether you're building an ASP.NET app or whether you're building a client app. And these libraries were built using Microsoft's secure development lifecycle. So take advantage of them. Next is clients should not be inspecting access tokens. Clients should be looking inside ID tokens for all the information that they need, such as first name, last name, or you can customize your ID tokens to contain any information that the client may need. Access tokens are intended to go to the resource. And if you start having clients you know, poking into the, ID, into the access tokens to read information, it prevents your ability to take advantage of other features down the road, like encrypting access tokens to pr protect PII information only intended for the resource. Don't try and create your own database of usernames and passwords. It's very difficult to get right. 
their salting, hashing, operational security, all sorts of issues to think about that are very difficult to implement correctly. If you do need to build an application that signs in your customers with a username and password that they create or an email password that they create, we have a great product called Azure AD B2C, and MCEL works great with it. Apps should never handle raw passwords. There is a flow supported by the libraries called Resource Owner Password Credential Grant. It's there for some scenarios where it makes sense, such as testing. If you need an automated test that signs in a user, this is a great flow. But you should never use it in your production apps intended for end users, and there's a couple reasons why. One is your app becomes a target for malicious actors if you're handling raw tokens. So it becomes a weak link in the end-to-end -end security. And remember, if you have your password, your consent dialogues are not going to stop an app from accessing data. The other is this really allows you to take advantage of all the f future innovation that comes from passwordless and from multi-factor authentication. If you're using uh, ROP username and password, you won't be able to take advantage of this. All of these best practices and many more are available on our identity platform checklist. And this is a great checklist to go through once you're ready to start moving your app to production to make sure that you've got everything taken care of. Let's talk about best practices for updating to the Microsoft Authentication Library. First does, we want you to write all of your new apps taking advantage of the Microsoft Identity Platform and the Microsoft Authentication Libraries. The reason for this is that all future innovation is going to happen on the new stack, and you want to be on the new stack to take advantage of this. If you have apps that were developed for Azure Active Directory for developers using our active Azure Active Directory library, or ADEL, we'd like you to update to the latest version of ADEL, and here's why. We made a significant investment in ADEL and in MCEL to make sure that your portfolio of ADEL and MCEL apps get great single sign-on experiences together. They have capabilities to read and write from a universal cache. In order to take advantage of this, you want to update your ADEL apps to the latest version of ADEL, even if you're not ready to move them to the Microsoft Authentication Library. And lastly, we're not ripping the rug out from underneath you. Update your apps to the Microsoft Authentication Library when you see value. And when you do, the apps that were previously built using ADEL will automatically keep that user signed in when that user uh, signs in with MSAL. I mentioned earlier that the Microsoft Identity Platform is an evolution of Azure Active Directory for developers. To demo this, we need an API that was protected using Azure Active Directory for developers. We have a to-do list application that you may be familiar with because it's all over our samples. It has a client and a server. The client is stateless, it just signs the user in, and the server keeps track of to-do list items for the signed in user. We're going to use this sample to demo a, calling a diverse set of APIs. OK, so what we have is this is the service running in the background. Uh, it's, in order to call the service, you need an access token. So it's not able to show uh, returning data without a client that's configured to do that. So let me show you the client. The client I'm signed in, I automatically got single sign-on, and as I enter my to-do list items here, they're sent to the server. So this, the client is stateless. It's sending all of this to the server, and I have a list of to-do items that is associated to me and no one else. Great, so this was built using Azure Active Directory for developers. The API was protected uh, using uh, ASP.NET, but going to our V1 endpoint, and uh, the client application was built using ADOM. Now, 
you've got this existing investment, and your boss comes to you with a new idea and says, hey, we're doing a conference, and we really need a kiosk. And you say, okay, great. Uh, sounds like an opportunity to take advantage of MCEL. Uh, this kiosk, when you walk up to it, you need to be able to sign in and see your list of to-do items. But there's one problem. This kiosk has no keyboard. Well, since mcell.net is now a true superset of the capabilities that existed in adel.net, you have access to the full range of authentication flows, including a flow called device code flow. Device code flow allows you to generate a URL, which can be turned into a QR code. And once you sign in using that URL or QR code on your mobile device, which you're probably already signed into, then you complete the flow on the, on the phone and you sign in, and that kiosk will be signed in as well. So let's go download a sample and see how this works. So this is one of the mcell.net samples that we have on GitHub. So if you go to GitHub forward slash Azure dash samples, you'll find a bunch of different mcell.net samples. This is one of them. And I made just some minor mo modifications in order to call my to-do my to-do list service, and I'm going to walk you through those changes. So first is, I had to ask for permission to access the data. Well, in Azure Active Directory for developers, a very common pattern was to ask for permission to access a service URI as the user, or it's called user impersonation. It basically allows you as a user, signed in user, to access all data behind a particular service. So I'm going to show you in the app, reg app registration portal what that looks like. We have two apps registered. One is the service, and one is the client. One of the key differences of the platform that existed before Azure Active Directory for developers is that you needed a separate app registration for all the different apps in your ecosystem. That's no longer necessary. You can now use one app for everything. So we could collapse these if we wanted to. But there are some advantages of having two separate app registrations in this scenario. Imagine you wanted an API that has its own logical entity that can be accessed from a wide variety of clients, some from your company and some from some other company. It may make sense to keep these separate. We're going to go into the service. and. This is the API that's exposed, so we're going to go into expose an API, and we're going to look at the permission. So this is just a default permission that was created when we created this app a long time ago called user impersonation. Uh, and it basically allows the user to do everything, read or write or anything that he wants to do with the to-do list service. And if we go back to the app registration for the client, and we go to API permissions that this app has requested, you'll see that listed right here is the to-do list service and the user impersonation. So now we want to build our kiosk application on mcell.net. Do we need an app registration? Well, we can actually use this one. Even though this app is working today and running with ADEL, we don't need to make any modifications to it. We can reuse the same app ID with our mcell app. So I'll grab the app application ID. And you can see that I'm using the same application ID here. And we've set up, I've changed the endpoint to be our to-do list endpoint. And I've set up the scope. So in Microsoft Identity Platform, scopes are human readable and least privileged. Scopes that existed prior for Azure Active Directory for developers were a service endpoint followed by a human readable least privileged scope. So we actually have to concatenate them 
in order to be able to call this API. This is the permission I need to ask for. This is the pattern to use when writing an MCEL app that accesses an API uh, protected with the V1. And the same pattern applies here. We try and acquire a token silently when we can't. Then we go through device code flow, and we're just going to print out the URL. And then the only other changes I made were very cosmetic. I pulled in the to-do list class, and I now have a display function to display my to-do list items. Other than that, I really didn't modify this example at all. So let's go ahead and run this. I thought about throwing up a QR code for everyone and having a race to see who could sign in first. But then the real test would have been to see if they were foolish enough to accept the consent dialogue and have their information displayed on the big screen. Okay, so I'm signing in. I want to get these side by side so you get to see it. I get single sign-on experience because I'm already signed in. I'm going to select this account. There's my to-do list. All right, let's talk about some of the releases and roadmap. Thank you to everyone that provided feedback while the app registrations experience was in preview. I'm happy to announce that the new app registrations experience in the Azure portal is now generally available. You can access it at ak.ms slash app registrations. We are targeting GA of the application API in Microsoft Graph by Ignite 2019. And I'm happy to announce that Microsoft Authentication Library uh, .NET and JS are now GA. You can find all the samples and docs for mcel.net already pointing to the GA library. And for mcel.js, you'll see the samples and uh, documentation pointing to the GA library by the time you get back to your office next week. We've also had made a lot of progress on MCEL Android and MCEL iOS. These are feature complete libraries, but they have a dependency on Authenticator app and company portal that's going to be rolling out in the coming month to enable some enterprise scenarios where you need to do uh, mobile device management. So it's GA. We want you to build an app. Who's betting on it within Microsoft? Let's talk about Visual Studio 16.1 preview, as well as the dev tools, so CLI, PowerShell, and the rest. All of these have already integrated with MCEL, and they're benefiting from single sign-on experiences across all of these. If you'd like to see a demo of this, Amanda has a session later today that where they show all of the dev tools signed in and getting full single sign-on experience across them. Next, in the demo this morning at the Rajesh keynote, Ashima showed the Authenticator app. This is using MCEL, and I just showed Graph Explorer. This is using MCEL.js. We also have APIs within Microsoft that are taking advantage of the Microsoft Identity Platform to secure their API. This includes Microsoft Advertising as well as Microsoft Graph. We want you to build your next application on the Microsoft Identity Platform. So Microsoft is using it. That's great. But do we have any customers at scale? At scale? Um, hey, you, sir, looks like you're uh, reading your email on your iOS device. Apple is providing a consistent user experience 
for all Microsoft identities, reducing developer complexity and reducing support costs for signing in Microsoft identities on Apple devices. Let's talk about certifications. We're on a mission to eliminate passwords, and we're happy to announce that Windows Hello is a FIDO2 certified authenticator. We are also committed to standards compliance. So I'm also happy to announce that the Microsoft Identity Platform Endpoint is now OpenID Connect certified. Lastly, let's talk about next steps. You can head on over to aka.ms slash identity platform to get started with our documentation. We also have public office hours that happen every two weeks on Thursdays. So you can join those to get feedback and get your questions answered. Sorry, give feedback. We also have a vibrant Stack Overflow community, so you can go there, post your question, and tag it with Microsoft Identity Platform. That's it, folks, for real this time.